G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Once again, coming at you from Washington-ish kind of area. Before we get into the video today, I would like to address something. I am incredibly hungover on some very bad idea red wine last night, so bear with me in today's video. Come to the States, spending heaps of time with family, it's really nice. Still getting to watch football as well, thanks to something called YouTube TV, which I didn't even know existed. I'm living La Vida Loca, and uh, today I'm paying the price for it, but... Today we're going to go through all of the round five action gather round. It was a really good round again. Um, I got six out of nine correct tips. And the reason I mentioned that is usually that's kind of an indicator as to to what extent this round surprised me. So there were some really good games. 50-50 uh, clashes, must win clashes already in round five, a top of the table clash. Uh, there was plenty going on. So let's get into all of that. As it stands, guys, about 42% of you guys who watch uh, the videos over the last month have not subscribed to the channel. So just as an aside, if you don't mind hitting that subscribe button to help grow the channel, if you're enjoying the content, Content, it'd be much appreciated. So Gather Round kicked off uh, on Thursday night with Adelaide taking on Carlton. I did do a video already uh, mostly on this game from Adelaide perspective and how their rebuild's going. So I've touched on some key points here, uh, but what a fantastic performance it was by the Crows to win by 56 points. It was a huge scalp. Obviously, they've been building since the 0-2 uh, start to the season. They've had three really good games, and this was the most impressive of the lot, beating a previously undefeated Carlton by 56 points. And the forward line I talked about in that video, it's just firing on all cylinders is arguably the best forward line in the competition right now. And uh, one guy that I didn't even mention in that video, which I regretted, was Darcy Fogarty, who kicked five goals in this game for the Adelaide Crows, along with Keyes swinging forward and kicked three. I think he kicked a bag in the preseason. He's showing some real uh, forward craft for a midfielder as well. And Tex Walker kicked three goals alongside them as well. The midfielders in Laird was impressive. This was the, probably the first game I think I can remember him really getting off the chain this year. He had 37 and nine clearances. Jordan Dawson, I highlighted as probably the top three players in the competition right now uh, where he had 32 touches and seven clearances really highlighting that successful move to the midfield so far this year for the blues uh, it was kind of they've kind of got a revolving door of uh, selection at the moment just with so many injuries going on at the moment not that's really an excuse for losing this game by 56 points but they did lose Mackay, who's been a really really important player this year acres and walsh uh, come back into the side walsh looks like he didn't really miss a beat acres was also very good in this game but ultimately they just couldn't keep up with adelaide as i said in the video earlier this weekend uh, the interesting stat from this game was that Carlton actually won the inside 50 count, which is uh, unusual for a 56 point loss, but the Crows were 24% more efficient going inside 50, which really speaks to their incredible forward line going on at the moment. So from a Blues perspective, I'll just say that they can probably shake this one off. I think there's been a lot of panic about this particular loss. Yes, it was a bad game, but it's probably time to start respecting Adelaide as a tough opponent, particularly in South Australia at the moment. The second game of gather round was Fremantle, who got the job done over the Gold Coast. Suns by 16 points and this was a much needed win for them and certainly a must win game in the context of this season. I think if had they dropped this game we probably ruled them out as a genuine finals contender but they overcame a 23 point deficit in the third term to drag their ass over the line against the struggling Gold Coast Suns. Sarong was brilliant in this game he had 37 touches and I think it was 8 clearances and Mickey Walters up forward kicked 4 goals as well. Another pleasing sign for them would be Luke Jackson getting on the end of a few marks and uh, kicking a couple of set shots. Obviously, we're still figuring out exactly how Luke Jackson is going to fit into this side, but if he can bob up for a couple of goals in a key forward-like manner per game, then, then he's getting the job done. So that's probably a tick for them there. Schultz as well, underrated player, kicked four goals. Uh, we know he's good and has been good for a long time, but he was fantastic. And Jai Amos as well kicked a bag of three as well and continuing his development as a potentially really good key forward going forward. There was no Jared Witts, of course, in this game. So Sean Darcy came up against the young Ned Moyle and absolutely annihilated him as he so often does. He had 48 hitouts and nine clearances in this game. And that went some way to Fremantle smashing the Suns, who are a pretty strong clearance side when you consider the mix of midfielders they've got in that side. It was also a narrower field this game, and therefore the contested battle in the midfield was uh, arguably slightly more important than usual. This is where Fremantle got a hold of him, winning the clearances 45 to 33. For the Suns, one of the standout players was Jack Lacocious, who's continuing his ascension to being you know, one of the better players in the league, in my opinion, at least I think he has that potential. He kicked one goal four, and unfortunately when they lose this by 16 points, you can't help but rue those missed opportunities. Other than David Swallow having a great game and kicking three goals with 20 possessions, the Suns forward line just looks a little bit dysfunctional at the moment, and it's not the, the lack of star power. I think they've got the star power, but they're actually ranked 18th in the league for Mark inside 50s uh, going into this game, I believe. And again, that dysfunction was kind of on show in this game. But overall, Fremantle get a much needed win, which will hopefully kickstart them getting back into gear because they still don't quite look like the same free medal from last year. 
On the other Friday game, Richmond took on Sydney and the Swans absolutely blasted them, particularly late to win this game by 44 points and a very convincing win. I think the Swans maybe came out a bit angry about the way they lost last week to Port and came out and made a bit of a statement. Tom Papley largely engineered this result with uh, six second half goals and 25 possessions. He was massive. The Swans actually went into this game with a completely decimated back line. In, in fact, their tools in general, it's, uh, it's a bit of a worrying situation for them. No McCartan brothers down back. Dane Rampey was unavailable. Sam Reed's obviously out, Buddy Franklin's out, Tom Hickey's out, and on top of that, Amati does a hammy in this game, I think, or a calf, I can't remember exactly, so they've got a bit of an availability crisis, but they powered through to win this game convincingly. Nick Blakey really stood up. I think I put him as my surprise All-Australian this year. Uh, he had a very good game out of the back half with 29 possessions. Errol Golden had something like 744 metres gained. Chad Warner had 26 possessions, 7 clearances, and something like 600 plus metres gained as well. So the regulars got the job done for the Swans. This was a strange sort of game for Richmond. They actually had a good run on in that third term where they kicked something like 7 out of a run of 9 goals. Liam Baker was particularly impressive, continuing his ascension again. Another one of those players that looks like he's taking the next step. He had 35 touches and a goal as well. The recruits in Toronto and Hopper were pretty productive in the midfield as well, but ultimately Richmond were a fair way off in the end. And they're kind of at a weird point, you know. They've only got six points out of five games to start this year, and that's three consecutive losses for them as well. So on the plus side, there is a fair bit of youth. They definitely are a side in transition. Some of those veterans are getting older and uh, being, you know, managed and stuff like that. They are proactively playing youth, so they're certainly not at a crisis point by any stretch of the imagination, but six points from five games. They certainly don't look like the finals lock that I might have thought they were, uh, you know, three weeks ago. Then the Brisbane Lions uh, annihilated the North Melbourne Footy Club at, uh, I think it was Adelaide Hills was the venue, the AFL's newest venue. Uh, winning this game by 75 points and their tall forwards in particular really got on the end of a few. Joe Danaher it was monstrous. He had five goals, something like 13 marks. Hipwood played well as well, kicking four goals. Charlie Cameron kicked another four goals. And they just had a day out, which was a little bit of a surprise. Obviously, we respect North so far this year. Um, this was one where they got a bit of a reality check as to how far they are off perhaps some of the best teams in the competition. Lockie Neal was massive in this game probably getting the three votes you'd think if Danaher doesn't get it, but he had 37 possessions and something like 13 clearances, which is insane. But despite his efforts, North actually did pretty well in the clearance stakes, but with the inside 50s is where the Lions really got a hold of him. Uh, something like 66 to 42, which resulted in 42 shots on the goal compared to just 17. So this result could have been worse. You can certainly uh, try and extract some positives for North Melbourne out of this game. Obviously, Harry Shields is another one, kicked his first goal at AFL level. Most touches by anyone after their first five games. He's looking fantastic. But Jaden Stevens is another one, obviously a bit of a malign player at times. Hasn't really found his groove, uh, you know, for a while now, let alone just at North Melbourne. But he's bobbed up with four goals in this game following three last week. So... I think he has the talent and ability to make that half-forward position his own. Again, I think this was simply a case of a young up-and-coming side with talent in North Melbourne getting a bit of a reality check against a rampaging, potentially premiership contender. Next, we have perhaps the most stunning result of the round. I think I even said in my Just the Tips video, I'd be shocked if Essendon beat Melbourne. And so they did win this game by 27 points and probably could have won it by more. So respect to Essendon, that is a big scalp to claim. Obviously, I think rightfully so, I've been a little bit cautious with rating Essendon on their form so far this season. I think the signs have been really positive under Brad Scott. But for them to beat Melbourne at a neutral ground by five goals, and Melbourne looked bloody good. I saw them in Perth the week before. This is a very legitimizing win for Essendon, and perhaps we do have to consider them as a genuine finals contender. The result is even more impressive when you factor in that Melbourne are very good at Adelaide Oval, and I think they've won eight of their last nine games there. Interestingly, Melbourne went into this game as the toughest team to score against from turnovers, and this is exactly where Essendon blew them away. They kicked seven goals in a row at one point, and led by as much as 42 points. Merritt had 35 touches through the midfield, but one thing that caught my eye was Sam Draper uh, playing a bit of a forward role, kicked three goals along with his 18 hitouts as well. So if he can be a more permanent, perhaps, solution to uh, Essendon's forward line woes, obviously, with their talls being unavailable. We've seen a couple of part-timers in Langford a couple of weeks ago, and Draper pushed forward and kick goals. And I do think that's probably a product of the fact that Essendon's system is working well at the moment. For the Ds, again, no reason to be concerned yet. I think we've seen their top form is pretty delicious this year. And Clayton Oliver actually had 41 touches in this game. Petrarca had 11 clearances. And yes, they're missing Gorn at the moment. But good teams will have off days. And this may be just that for Melbourne. But congratulations to Essendon. This is a big win. And uh, this could potentially propel them into something meaningful this season. Hey, guys. I just want to interrupt this video for one brief moment to talk to you a little bit about Druzy's Athlete Academy. We're now in partnership with the True Footy YouTube channel as well. So if you're not aware, my good friend Druzy has launched his own online strength and conditioning coaching business. 
The service that he provides is online one-on-one -on -one coaching directed at young athletes who are trying to take their game to the next level. Drew's has gone and got qualified as a sports scientist, and now he can provide professional strength and conditioning coach for anyone looking to take their fitness game to the next level. Whether you're a young prospective athlete who wants to level up, who wants to get drafted, or potentially, you know, play another sport to a very, very high level, your strength and conditioning is so central to that, and Drew's can give you personalized programs tailored to your specific needs. But it's not just for athletes. If you're just someone who wants to get into the gym or perhaps has been going to the gym for a while and has started to stagnate, the benefit of Drewsy's Athlete Academy is that because he's a qualified sports scientist, you can take out all the guesswork and you can get personalized programs to help you fulfill whatever your goals are. There's running programs, there's gym beginner programs, there's muscle bolt programs. I know personally for me, I started getting into the gym about 10 years ago. I was a skinny little rat and some might say I'm still a skinny rat, but regardless, bulking up, getting a bit of muscle, feeling confident in my own fitness was the best thing I ever did. And I know that there's a huge correlation between how good I'm feeling in my general well-being and how strong and fit I'm feeling as well. So with the partnership you have through True Footy, you can get 20% off on any program at Drewsy's Athlete Academy. You simply just have to use the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout on the website. So do go check out the website. The link for that is in the description. And remember, you get 20% off and you'll be investing in yourself. So it would be money well spent. Then we had Port Adelaide and the Western Bulldogs uh, do battle at Adelaide Oval on the Saturday night. I'm, my time zones are all messed up, so I think it was Saturday night. For me, one of the more interesting games uh, going into it because two teams were kind of getting a read on, a couple of uh, two and two teams at the time, mixed bag of results, wasn't sure who would lift, and I actually felt confident in the Bulldogs winning this game, but it was Port Adelaide who prevailed in a quite a gutsy win in tough conditions. It was pissing down, and they kicked the final four goals to ultimately claim two wins in a row against last year's finalists. Zach Butters was best on ground in this game, arguably, with 32 possessions and the winning goal right at the end there. Rosie and Wines were strong through the midfield as well with 26 possessions as well. But importantly, I think Port Adelaide's uh, defense really held up in this game. Uh, in particular, Aaliyah Aaliyah and his, his diving tackle to, to almost save the game in the dying minutes. Uh, the guy's done it two weeks in a row. Well done. Miles Bergman was also very good in this game. That's for you, Ben. Darcy Byrne-Jones actually moved into the forward line in this game in, on a night where goals were worth their weight in gold. He kicked a couple of goals as well, which was crucial in securing the result. Jason Horn francis in that last quarter also really stood up, obviously with the, the hype around him and the, the fact that he's been traded, I think naturally he attracts some criticism, but, but in that last quarter, he had something like 11 touches, seven of them contested, four clearances, and uh, was instrumental in helping Port Adelaide get over the line. For the Dogs, their midfield warriors were once again back at it, and uh, Bontempelli had something like a monstrous 10 clearances by halftime. That is insane. I think he finished with 12, uh, but as well, Trelaw was fantastic as well, 35 touches and eight clearances as well, trying to wheel their side over the line. And uh, I think the other noteworthy thing for the dogs here was the reintroduction of Cody Waitman into their midfield. Just gives them a bit of that spark back and him kicking four goals in a low scoring contest uh, obviously helps as well. So the Power have had a tough run of five games to start this year and they come out of it three and two with wins over Brisbane in emphatic fashion. Uh, they obviously beat Sydney last Last week in Sydney, tough ask, and they've beaten the Bulldogs in a tough tussle here. Their two losses have been against Collingwood, arguably the benchmark of the competition right now, and then Adelaide as well, who are looking pretty strong too, and we don't know what to make of them. So the narrative has gone like this, but perhaps Port Adelaide are actually like this. And I'll put my hand up and say, I have not read them well this year at all. Then on Sunday, I think we had what we all expected to be the grand final preview this year in Geelong and West Coast at Adelaide Oval, with Geelong getting the job done by 47 points. It was a weird sort of game, to be honest. Geelong annihilated West Coast in that second term. I think they kicked 12 unanswered goals or something like that, and 14 out of 15 in a between the halfway point of the first quarter and half time and just completely killed the game in a way that we know that Geelong is capable of and they did last week against Hawthorne too. The Cats obviously uh, at 0-3 looked a little bit toothless and uh, in the second half particularly against Hawthorne and West Coast now. Admittedly they're the, probably the bottom two sides in the competition right now but I think we've kind of played Geelong into form a little bit and they might have found their teeth a little bit so it'll be interesting to see how they go from this point on in the season. Cameron and Hawkins kick four goals each which is you know not a massive shock uh, when you consider the Eagles don't really have a second key defender to begin with, let alone those guys are absolute guns. Uh, but Asava Radagalia was also pretty eye-catching at playing as a loose defender. And the Cats smashed the midfield battle 51 clearances to 31, which is um, a big shock to you all, I'm sure. 
from an Eagles perspective, yes, the first half was really disappointing, but I think you have to acknowledge that, that that's a massive improvement on where we were 12 months ago, considering now the injuries at West Coast are comparable to what they were in 2022, but we're seeing a very different side. West Coast last year would not have shaved that 77-point margin back to 47 by the end of the game. In fact, it got down to 42. Throughout the third and I think the fourth term as well, there was a series of nine goals where West Coast had actually kicked seven of them, and the Eagles actually won the third and fourth turn. Notably as well, despite the clearance differential. West Coast generated 48 inside 50s. Yes, it was way less than Geelong, but last year, if you remember, we were getting like high 20s to mid 30s some games. I'm staying glass half full on the Eagles at the moment as best as possible, and that second half has given me enough to feel a little bit comfortable with the direction of the team at the moment. Waterman and Allen kicking four goals was also really, really good to see. Two guys that, uh, well, Waterman, you know, was certainly not a lock to be best 22 this year. It's a second bag of four this year, and Allen is something like equal third in the common after missing last year. So plenty of positive signs for the Eagles. Then we had a thrilling contest between the Giants and the Hawks. No one really would have expected this to be one of the matches of the round, uh, but it certainly proved to be that way with Harry Hilmerberg being the hero in the dying stages. Took that absolute screamer, goes back and kicks the winning goal, and then desperately... Uh, dives over his head to touch a ball through to uh, Russia behind instead of concede a goal, which ultimately won them the game. So that's one of the better individual efforts we've seen to win a game since last week and earlier. earlier. No, let's be real. It, it exceeds it. That's a fantastic effort in the dying stages. It was a really even game this. Hawthorne looked probably the better of the two sides for about a quarter and a half, but GWS's defense, in particular Sam Taylor, really, really stood up and were solid as a rock, really. Jai Newcomb had 31 touches and 10 clearances, and perhaps even more pleasingly, James Warple had a bit of a return to form. He had 35 touches and 8 clearances in this game. One, it's great for my fantasy, and two, it's obviously a player that uh, won a best and fairest back in like 2019 or 2020, has dipped off to the point where he's no longer considered a surefire part of their future going forward, but this was a really a pleasing return to form, I'm sure. The two Greens at uh, GWS were also really prevalent in this game. Tom Green got tagged out a little bit in the second half, but still finished the game with 32 touches and nine clearances and Toby Green had 24 touches and three goals he's just doing Toby Green shit but there's the third Green in this game that also played pretty well Fergus Green who used to play for the Bulldogs has joined the Hawks this year of course as a sort of medium forward prolific goal kicker in the VFL bobbed up for three goals and showed that he's starting to look more ready at this level when the Giants won this game I must admit I had the thought I wonder how disappointed Hawthorne actually are to lose that game you know we all have theories about the Harley Reid Cup at the end of the year and them shedding all their experience and potentially breaking racing for a wooden spoon. Maybe this game went perfectly for them. Who knows? I'm not saying they're tanking, obviously, but sometimes it's good to play well and still get the L if you're chasing draft picks. The final game of the round was the one we were all most interested to see because it was a top of the table clash between Collingwood and St Kilda at Adelaide Oval and Collingwood of course got the job done by six points. There was an admirable late comeback by the Saints. They kicked three goals in stoppage time. Stoppage time? I haven't even moved to England yet. They kicked three late goals in time on to almost snatch this contest but Collingwood prevailed. The ruck situation is critical at Collingwood of course. Um, Darcy Cameron did his MCL and is out for a couple of months. I'm reliably informed. They were sort of using McStay as a sort of part-time ruck in his absence, but he got injured in the second term of this game. But regardless, the pies were too good. Uh, Dugowie being a laid out didn't help with this game. And of course, St Kilda have their injury issues as well. But Nick Dacos had one of his most statistically, in fact, his most statistically prolific game at AFL level, having 42 touches, 846 metres gained, eight rebound 50s and eight inside 50s. So this guy's just everywhere. We should also acknowledge his younger brother, Josh, who is putting together a pretty good season as well. He's he's considered the, the there's the good day cost and the not good day cost, or at least that's how my dad describes him. But he's actually a pretty handy footballer and putting together a career best season with 27 touches a game. For the Saints, I think this, this loss uh, still validates them to some extent because Collingwood are the benchmark of the competition. And St Kilda, despite being uh, previously undefeated, hadn't really claimed that big, big scalp, or at least Collingwood would have been. But credit to them, I think their defense held up really, really well. It's a strong back six headed by Callum Wilkie, who was uh, he's continuing an All-Australian run of form at the moment. He had 24 disposals, 10 marks, 11 intercepts, or the other way around. Josh Battle was also really good in there as well, and they conceded just the 10 goals in this game. Yes, they didn't win, but the defense, as is typical under Ross Lyon, is proving to be really strong. Brad Crouch also had a really noteworthy game in the midfield with 33 touches, 2 goals, and 9 clearances, which is uh, as good as it gets, really. Like I said, despite the loss, there's still some legitimacy here with St Kilda. They are not far off the game very best and will feature in September I strongly believe that all right guys that wraps up the video let me know in the comments what you thought of my review and uh, obviously what you agree with what you disagree with what was something I missed from this round that you think is particularly noteworthy I'd love to hear from you as always guys appreciate the support and I'll see you in the next video cheers